Hello, I am Karthik Godavarti, Faculty of Anthropology at Vajiram and Ravi. In this video, let's look at the paper 1 of Anthropology Optional that has come in this year's Civil Service Mains Examination 2024. Let's first try to understand the nature of this year's paper and the key takeaways before we go into any kind of details. Number 1. Anthropology papers this year once again reiterate the fact that one should never ignore the basic and theoretical concepts in the discipline. A mindless hunt for case studies or current affairs may hijack your attention from focusing on the basics. This is very important takeaway for all the current and future aspirants. Be thorough with the defined syllabus and foundational concepts. Once this is done, you can go to add value to your basic content. Number two, this year once again proves the point that anthropology papers are indeed straightforward and objective. The questions are direct and leave very little scope for any confusion or subjectivity. Number three, the questions are well within the scope of the syllabus. Yes, owing to the vastness of Indian anthropology, some topics may seem like out of the blue, but by and large, the examiners have confined themselves to defined syllabus in both the papers. The focus on every minute detail seems to be the standard going forward. So, you need to be careful about this. And number four, the paper is potentially high scoring. There is a reasonable scope for 300 plus if the choices are exercised with caution. And number five, a balance seems to have been maintained in descriptive and analytical questions. Questions like climate change and contemporary tribal societies, COVID-19 and tribal health, or anthropological ethics and AI evidence this fact. An aspirant to civil services should not be content with just descriptive knowledge, whether it is general studies or optional subjects. The analytical and critical thinking abilities are put to test. One should be thorough in basics and have an ability to connect the concepts to the issues to address this. The first question in the short notes is attributes of culture. Now, this is a pretty straightforward question and touches the basic understanding of the candidate. You are expected to present the attributes or qualities of culture, especially those as highlighted by Ail Kroba. These include overtness and covertness, explicit and implicit, organic and superorganic, ethos and idos, ideality and reality, etc. A very high scoring question indeed. The second question is actually from Indian prehistory mentioned in paper 2. But this trend of seeing questions from prehistoric archaeology of India in paper 1 has now become common. The question is Harappan maritime trade. You will need to mention that India is in fact one of the oldest maritime nations in the world and the Harappans were the first mariners of the Indian subcontinent. Evidence exists that they have sailed to Mesopotamia crossing the Persian Gulf. The Mesopotamian inscriptions mention the import of items from Meluha, the name Harappa was given in their language. Harappan maritime trade demonstrates not only the sophistication of design of the boats, but also a deep knowledge of navigation, sea and weather conditions. You need to also mention some important ports of this area. And the third short note is critical perspective on avoidance and joking. Now, these are kinship behaviors or usages. Joking and avoidance represent coactive behavior patterns which exhibit regularity, while avoidance represents restricted social interactions between certain types of kin, joking represents an example of extreme familiarity. Many anthropologists have tried to evaluate the evolution and the functional significance of these kinship behaviors. Some noteworthy anthropologists amongst them include Sir James George Fraser, Sigmund Freud, A. R. Ratcliffe Brown, Turney High, Chapel and Kuhn, and R. H. Lowy. You are expected to mention their insights in one or two sentences each. 
The questions in physical anthropology will be dealt by my colleague Mr. Vinoy Krishna separately as a part of another video. Let's move to question 2a which is discuss historical particularism as a critical development to classical evolutionism. Now this is a 20 mark question. This question expects you to demonstrate how historical particularism of Franz Boves was a reaction to the propositions of classical evolutionary theory by the 19th century anthropologists like Tyler, Morgan and Fraser. Bovis criticized evolutionism as a theory based on unreliable, unscientific and secondary data. He said classical evolutionism used a prior scheme and then went on to fit the different cultures into them, which is against scientism. He called the typology of savagery, barbarism and civilization as extremely ethnocentric. He also criticized the crudeness of their comparative method and maintain that the laws proposed by them are not real laws, but only some regularities in human cultures. In fact, he was against any attempt to make laws without proper method. It was this reaction that led to the development of historical particularism and of course cultural relativism. You need to establish this and then go on to elaborating his theory. And question 2b is on the evidence of food production and animal domestication with special reference to Mehergad. Mehergad is a large Neolithic and Chalcolithic site located at the Bolan Pass in Balochistan in the modern day Pakistan. Continuously occupied between 7000 to 2600 BC, Mehergad is the earliest known Neolithic site in the northwest Indian subcontinent with early evidence of farming, herding and metallurgy. This is considered to be one of the earliest sites of the Neolithic farming in South Asia and a precursor to the life in the Indus Valley before Harappa. It is known for one of the earliest production of wheat and barley and the domestication of sheep, cattle and goats. Later periods at this site included craft activities such as tanning and expanded beet production and a significant level of metal working, particularly copper. The site was occupied continuously until about 2600 BC when it was abandoned about the time when the Harappan period of the Indus Valley civilization began to flourish at Harappa, Mohenjo-Daro and Kodiji. And question 2c is critically comment on the lifestyle diseases and their impact on human health. A question from the chapter on epidemiological anthropology. Lifestyle diseases demonstrate the importance of the role of anthropology in understanding health and disease within the context of human cultures and behaviors. Understanding the nature of lifestyle diseases requires a biocultural paradigm which is at the heart of epidemiological anthropology. Lifestyle diseases also demonstrate the interplay of biology and culture and of course the environment. Evolutionarily speaking, the lifestyle diseases are a consequence of multiple events beginning with Neolithic transition and the subsequent urbanization and increase in sedentism. Once a characteristic feature of modern societies their incidence is increasing even in the traditional societies across the world. These diseases are often chronic with long-term health impacts and are the leading cause of death globally. The study on non-infectious diseases from an anthropological perspective provides insights into how culture, economic and environmental factors contribute to the prevalence, manifestation and management. Examples include the CVDs like hypertension, heart attacks and strokes, diabetes, cancers and even some mental health disorders like anxiety and depression. Common factors include the dietary shifts, physical inactivity, lifestyles, tobacco and alcohol use, stress and other environmental factors. Question 3b is define urbanization 
and discuss its impact on family in India with examples. Urbanization is defined as a process by which a large number of people become permanently concentrated in relatively small areas, forming cities, towns and other dense conglomerates. It is driven by the various socio-economic factors such as industrialization, employment opportunities, better living standards and access to services like education and healthcare. Urbanization has been a handmaiden of industrialization and both these processes together have fundamentally altered traditional family systems, especially in India. Some of the impacts include the shift from extended to nuclear families, a redefinition of gender roles, economic pressures and dual income families, fragmentation of family support systems, erosion of traditional value systems, etc. The impact of urbanization can also be seen in penetrating rural and tribal societies in India too. Some examples from the Central Indian Tribal Belt can also be cited in this context because this is the region that has been witnessing hectic industrialization and hence urbanization in the form of large townships in tribal India. Question 3C is discuss the contemporary challenges in the fieldwork method in anthropological research. Well, fieldwork is the process of collecting descriptive data on specific culture through extended periods of time, living with the members of that particular culture. Anthropology is shaped by fieldwork and that anthropologists are in turn shaped by their field experiences. A hallmark of social and cultural anthropology, fieldwork defines anthropology and gives it a distinctive identity. There are practical, methodological, moral and ethical challenges in fieldwork. Contemporary fieldwork, in addition, has certain challenges exacerbated by increasingly globalized societies with multicultural and dynamic identities. The postmodern and postcolonial anthropology also encounters challenges in keeping ethnographies polyvocal, being reflexive, and also culturally relativistic. The expansion of the field of anthropology to online communities in the cyber world also throws up challenges that include data privacy and security. Ethical issues also include data confidentiality informed consent and the utility of the research for the informants, etc. Question 4a is from Culture and Personality School. Critically discuss the characteristics of the psychological types in the cultures of the American Southwest as observed by Ruth Benedict. Benedict was a student of Bovis and she proposed the theory of configurational personality. Starting with the ethnographic study of the Soshonian Serrano people in the Morongo Valley in 1922, Benedict went on to complete major anthropological studies of the Zuni in 1924, the Pima in 1926, and soon thereafter the Apache of the Southwest, as well as the various plain Indian tribes. She believed culture is like an individual has a basic and consistent pattern of thought and action. According to her, when traits and complexes become functionally integrated with each other, a cultural pattern is formed. The totality of ethos and other subordinate patterns give every culture its unique design called the configuration. The configuration can be easily identified from the personality of the individuals in a culture. She identified two types of geniuses, Apollonian and Dionysian. Apollonian ethos is the existence of peace, discipline, kindness and collectivism, like in the Zuni of the Southwest America and the Dionysian is characterized by aggression and individualism the Quokotl or the Dobu. You will need to elaborate on these points 
and the propositions of a theory and you should also conclude your answer by adding some critique. Question 4b is again from prehistoric archaeology from India. Discuss the Acheulean and the Oldowan traditions of Indian Paleolithic cultures with suitable illustrations. Oldowan represents the evolution of cognition and technology in human cultures. Acheulean represents advancement in tool technology from the Oldowan. Lower Paleolithic phase in India consists of two principal tool making or cultural traditions, which are the Soanian tradition forming the part of East and Southeast Asian chopper chopping tool tradition and number two, the hand axe cleaver or biface assemblages constituting the Acheulean tradition, which is widely known from the western half of the old world, which is Africa, Western Europe, West and also South Asia. The Soanian type pebble tool assemblages were part of a spread of the Oldowan tradition of East Africa across Asia by a northern route between 1.8 and 2 million years ago. You will then need to elaborate some specifics about both these traditions like choppers and flake tools of Oldowan or Soanian type pebble tools and the Acheulean artifacts like cleavers, hand axes, hammer stones, etc. Since the question is specifically mentioning illustrations, you must include these in your answers too. Moving to section B, the first short note is chronometric dating, a question from prehistoric archaeology. From prehistoric archaeological point of view, dating is usually defined as locating an archaeological specimen in time. Two basically different types of dating methods are recognized, relative dating and absolute dating. Relative dating methods reveal the temporal order of a sequence of material, object or events, disclosing whether these occurred before, contemporary or after other cultural materials or objects or events. Absolute dating is also known as chronometric dating and these methods reveal the age measured in calendar years of materials, objects or events. Chronometric dating methods make use of a variety of physical or chemical measurements and ascertain the time when these events occurred or when materials and objects were made, used or altered. Chronometric dates are not exact dates but only numerical age estimations and are generally expressed as a range of dates. The various types of chronometric dating methods include radiocarbon, potassium argon, amino acid racemization, dendrochronology, obsidian hydration dating, thermoluminescence and even archaeomagnetism etc. You need to briefly explain each one in a sentence or two. Question 5b is cultural relevance of Kula. The description of Kula by Malinowski and subsequently by Marce Mohr is a demonstration of functionalism as a method in anthropology. This question is capturing this very essence. You are expected to reveal the cultural and functional significance of Kula in your answer. Briefly describe the Kula system as a ceremonial exchange and focus on the relevance including its role in social integration and inter-island relationships, political alliances and diplomacy, redistribution of wealth and resource exchange, social status and prestige, cultural continuity and knowledge transmission and also highlight its role in conflict resolution and social cohesion. You may also include Marseille Moss conception of the spirit of gift in Kula and the moral and spiritual force inherent in the act of giving as demonstrated in the Kula exchange. Question 5D is authority and forms of political organization. A simple and a very straightforward question. Very briefly, you should explain the different forms of political organizations that emerged due to the locus of authority. These include the acephalous, multicentric 
and the centralized political organizations. Starting from the band-based political organizations through various tribal systems like lineage, clan, age grade, association-based and big man-based systems to chiefdoms and states, you need to very briefly explain the types with examples. Question 6a is from Paleoanthropology. Discuss the geographical distribution of Homo erectus. Taking into account its physical features, where does it fit in the human evolutionary line? A typical question from this chapter asking you to discuss the discovery, general characteristics, geographical distributions and the phylogenetic implications of the human fossil ancestor, Homo erectus. And Homo erectus represents the first instance of a hominid moving out of Africa. Its fossils were discovered from not just Africa but also from Asian sites like Java, Peking and also in Europe it was represented by the Heidelberg specimen. You will need to give a general account of both the biological and cultural characteristics and conclude with the discussion on its phylogenetic status in the human evolution. And question number 6c is from Structural School of Thought. How does Levi Strauss look at the Shimshian myth of Asdivab? Critically discuss Levi Strauss's theory of structuralism in the light of his study of mythologies. Levi Strauss, the French anthropologist and the founder of the structural school of thought, demonstrated his theory and method in the analysis of kinship and mythologies. The structural analysis of myths has been his major area of focus and you will need to briefly explain the basic propositions of his structural school of thought, including his assumptions like universality of the human thought, binary oppositions and how cultural behavior is a manifestation of underlying thought processes. The agenda of structuralism is not to study the obvious but what lies beneath. It is the study of the pattern and not the substance. It's not the behavior itself that the structuralists study, but the rationale and the reason behind it. It is the underlying structures of the human mind, what he refers to as elementary structures, that one can unravel through the study of myths. In his work, The Story of Asdival, he deconstructs the myth using a structuralist framework to uncover the underlying structure that governs the myths across cultures. By doing so, he illustrates how myths, like languages, follow certain rules and structures that transcend individual cultural contexts. The Asdival myth is a mythological narrative from the Shimshian people of British Columbia in Canada. The story revolves around the character Asdival, a hunter and a warrior who embarks on a journey that takes him through various realms, geographic, social and spiritual. In his journey, Asdival encounters supernatural beings and faces challenges related to nature and human society and experience love and conflict. Levi Strauss's interpretation of Asdival myth focuses on the idea that myths serve as a means of resolving the fundamental contradictions present in the human thought. These contradictions, according to Levi Strauss, stem from binary oppositions that exist at the core of human cognition, such as life and death, nature and culture, male and female, and so on. You will also need to add the critique to structural approach in your answer. And you may find it interesting to know that the Shimshian folk tales were also analyzed by another very important anthropologist. Do you know who? Well, it was Franz Bovis who compared around 20 different versions of their folk tales existing in about 75 separate Shimshian tribes. Bovis used them to demonstrate cultural diffusion, just like the way Levi Strauss did to demonstrate his structuralism.
7a is also a question from anthropological thought. It reads, critically explain the notion of deconstruction in the light of the postmodern works of Jacques Derrida. Jacques Derrida is a French philosopher and he is best known for developing the theory of deconstruction. And this has influenced many fields, including anthropology, through his postmodern critique of traditional structures of meaning. Derrida's postmodernism challenges established ideas of truth identity and meaning, which had significant implications for anthropological theory and methods. Traditionally, ethnographic texts were often seen as objective accounts of other cultures. Well, Derrida's deconstruction challenged this very idea by arguing that all the texts, including ethnographies of anthropology, are inherently unstable with multiple meanings. Derrida critiqued the Western philosophical tradition for its reliance on logocentrism. Logocentrism is the idea that language and meaning are centered around a single foundational truth, which is the logo. He also critiqued binary oppositions, such as civilized and primitive, or us and them, which have been central to anthropological thought. Anthropology traditionally relied on dichotomies like modern and uh, primitive, right? And at the same time, Western and non-Western, and often placing the non-Western societies in a subordinate position. And this is some kind of a trend that we start witnessing right from the origins of anthropology since 19th century. Well, Derrida's critique helped anthropologists realize the problematic nature of such binaries because they perpetuate hierarchical thinking and ethnocentrism. Derrida's critique encouraged anthropologists to start rethinking on how they will represent other cultures and to recognize politics of representation. It underscored the need to avoid imposing the rigid categories of anthropology on diverse cultures. Derrida's philosophy also has ethical implications for anthropology, particularly in its call to question the ways we construct the other. Deconstruction, a term coined by Derrida, is not a straightforward or simple deconstruction of ideas, but rather a critical strategy aimed at exposing the internal contradictions, instabilities and the multiple meanings within a text or a system of thought. And question 7c is from research methodology. A straightforward question discuss the applicability of various sampling techniques in selecting the study group. Sampling refers to the process of selecting a subset of individuals, cases from a larger population, to make inferences about the whole population. It allows researchers to study large populations by examining a smaller manageable subset which is the representative of a larger group. Sampling, when chosen correctly, can reduce costs, increase speed, enable practicality and improves accuracy. Broadly, there are two types of sampling, probability and non-probability sampling. A sampling technique where each member of the population has a known and equal chance of being selected is what is known as probability sampling. This method relies on the principle of randomization with reduced bias. The results are more reliable and this is used in quantitative research where statistical analysis is a priority. Non-probability sampling is where the samples are gathered in a process that does not give all the individuals in the population equal chances of being selected. This method is often based on subjective judgment and the discretion of the researcher. There is a higher risk of selection bias in this method and it is commonly used in qualitative research where emphasis is on the depth and detail rather than statistical representation. You need to explain the different types of probability and non-probability samplings. Like for example, 
Probability sampling techniques include simple random sampling, systematic sampling, cluster sampling, etc. And non-probability sampling may include convenient sampling, purposive or judgmental sampling, snowball and also quota sampling. You need to briefly explain each one of them. And uh, question number 8a is examine critically the concept of social stratification as a basis for sustaining social inequality. And for this question which is asked from the chapter on the nature of society, you will need to explain how social inequality emerges in a society that is based on evaluations attached to socially and naturally occurring differences between the humans. Social inequality in turn can exist with or without creating a hierarchy. While the former is referred to as social differentiation, the latter is called social hierarchy, which is also known as social stratification. You need to explain the process of stratification, including the differential distribution of rewards, prestige associated with them, etc. Also, explain the models of stratification which perpetuate social inequality, including caste, class and gender. And question 8c is again from human evolution. Critically discuss the synergistic effects of biological and cultural factors in human evolution. Questions based on this theme have been appearing frequently in this exam. A very simple and straightforward question indeed. Hominization is a process of evolution of hominids from hominoids. And hominization is characterized by changes associated with biology as well as behavior or culture. The major biological themes include bipedalization, subsequent freeing of hands from locomotion, evolution of prehensility and opposability, leading to the power grip and the precision grip, skeletal modifications and realignment of the body towards erect posture, encephalization, which is the progressive expansion of the brain, and changes in the structure, modification of the masticatory processes, that is the face, the jaw, the teeth, and all the related structures, and extension of the gestationary and postnatal development processes, etc. You will need to subsequently associate these changes to the concomitant changes in culture, like tool making and tool use, improved hunting and food access dietary shifts, complex division of labor, language and communication, formation of society and cultural norms, increased lifespans, enculturation, etc. So these are the brief discussions on the questions in paper 1. We shall look at paper 2 in a subsequent video. Thank you for watching.